Imagine. Imagine a place where one day all the police force resigns. All 600 of them. And in this place, there's minimal amount of crime. People go on with their daily lives, just doing their usual thing. And that's how it is. That continues on and on despite conflict. Where is this place? Costa Rica? Island in the Pacific? In my head? This is the occupied Palestinian territories in January 1988. This is where I live. This is where I've lived, in fact, since 1978. I was born and brought up in Oxford, in England. And then I married a Palestinian and taught for a few years in BS8 University. But I hadn't really seen much of life outside a university. And I thought I would like to learn something and do other things that might be more interesting. So I started to look. And it didn't take long. I was out for a walk one evening with my husband, just around the corner, in fact, just around there. And we bumped into an old friend. And he asked, would I like to run a center he was setting up? to prepare for the Palestinian elections? And would I also, by the way, like to take over a nonviolent center he'd set up? And I didn't know much about elections, and I didn't know much about nonviolence. But I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And so I tried it. I didn't know that this would be starting me off for 16 years of uh, work with nonviolence. This was 1994. And I've learned a lot, a huge amount, and I'd like to share some of these lessons with you. First of all, I just plunged into the work. There seemed to be so much to be done that I organized demonstrations, I organized town hall meetings, I organized petitions. In fact, in uh, one of the town hall meetings, I, uh, I'd organized to prepare for elections in the town of Janine. It was interesting because uh, I was actually the only woman in the room as one of the speakers, other than the woman who happened to be handing around a plate of biscuits. And I thought, well, this means there needs to be more work organizing also meetings where women will come and perhaps projects for women. So I organized some of those too. But this organization closed down after a few years. Not not because of the occupation, just because it ran into internal problems. So I thought I would set up my own organization, building on the lessons that I'd learned about education and about women and about really about the power of nonviolence, which seemed to me something that wasn't exploited enough, despite the fact that Palestine has a really long history of nonviolence, and especially even a history of women being involved in nonviolence, where they sent petitions even from the 1920s, and where throughout the struggle there have been major nonviolence movements. But anyway, I figured there was a lot to be done with education. For instance, when I would organize a demonstration, it would be mostly the leaders who would come and not, not so much the people. And so I set about thinking what needed to be done and what issues I would address. And one of the first lessons I learned was that stereotypes start really early. Stereotypes are deeply ingrained, and they start really, really young. I was working with Sesame Workshop, and they had done research. This was during the years of the peace process. And they had found that even three-year-olds, three-year-old Israeli children, three-year-old Palestinian children have deeply ingrained stereotypes, really horrible stereotypes of each other. So this was one of my first lessons. How do we deal with stereotypes? A second lesson, a small investment, can have a great impact. Funding comes and goes. And one day, 
I had written an article uh, about women and nonviolence, calling for women to connect across nonviolence and across the conflict. This was when it was actually really, really bad. I wanted to do something about it. And based on this article, I was one evening at a ballet class. My daughter was learning ballet in Jerusalem at the time. And one of the mums there had read this article and asked me, what would I do if I had a million dollars? So I thought a bit and I said, work with the media. And I, of course, thought of billboards and I thought of TV ads, all the, the nice things you can do with a million dollars, which, of course, I didn't have. So next morning, I happened to be driving back from dropping my daughter at school, and I was stuck in traffic behind one of these white vans, and it was covered in bumper stickers, really nasty bumper stickers, in fact, settler bumper stickers. But I thought, well, I remember someone offered me $5,000 to, for, you know, if I thought of a good idea. So maybe, maybe I can use this $5,000 at least and do some bumper stickers. So I rang up the person who'd offered, and he said, fine. And I thought I could ask a whole lot of questions, like, where are you going? What, what do you want to happen? And we more or less did this. I made bumper stickers with Arabic and English and Hebrew and English so that people would connect across seeing someone else with the same sticker. We had a lovely one, what about our children, was what people really liked. But there was another one that I thought people would like. And I was checking with my Israeli friend what would work on her side. And I was, of course, checking what would work on the Palestinian side. And it was very, very difficult to find things that would work on both sides. You'd be surprised how tough it was. But the, there was one I had called um, We Are All Human Beings. And I thought, this is a, you know, surely this is necessary in this time of hate and polarization and dehumanization. And my friend came back to, oh, no one wants this. They think it's too obvious. Why do you want to do it? And I, I thought, ah, oh, that means we really have to do it in that case. <laughs> now, another lesson, perhaps one of the most important, is to start with oneself and with us and not with them. It's no good talking about other people's stereotyping. I have to work, and I do work, on how I see things, what my stereotypes are, my prejudices are. People often assume that working with peace or nonviolence means putting people together across the conflict. And I'd had some really not very good experiences trying to work with joint camps and dialogue and stuff. So I wanted to work just with one side. It's, it's really important to deal with one's own issues before mixing people. It, it's far more important. No one wants to hear other people's problems while they still have their own. Also, in this conflict, there's a lot of problems of people seeing themselves as victims. And when you're a victim, you push other people into becoming monsters. You, it, there doesn't leave any room for middle ground. So it's all the more important just to work and work with one side. So we tried an approach to bring children 14-year-old, very sensitive age around identity, and to bring them from different parts of the world, brought from South Africa and the north of Ireland, to be with young Palestinian kids. And this was an incredible success. The first year we did it, we just had six South Africans, six Palestinians from a trauma center in South Africa. The second year, the South Africans said, you sent our children back so happy. We're sending you a girl who was traumatized at the age of five because she witnessed a massacre. We want to see what you can do with her. And it was amazing, the transformation that happened. Within a few days, she was singing and dancing. By the end of the camp, which included a lot of nonviolence, role-playing, and a lot of drama, psychodrama, things like this, by the end of the camp, she, she was performing on the stage. She had, it had worked, this idea that you just bring from one side together. Lesson four, plant many seeds. Our work has involved a lot of seeds, working with schools. Now the Ministry of Education has taken our work and is beginning to build a nonviolent strategy for schools. 
working with a radio soap opera, working with many, many different approaches, including top-down, bottom-up, and so on, in the hopes that some of these seeds will grow. Lesson five, adjust, innovate, be creative. People that work with nonviolence are not saints, and one often runs into problems in any organization, whether it's nonviolence or an other organization. There are problems, and these things happen. Funding dries up. The radio soap opera was fantastic. People listened from all over the country. They were calling us from Gaza every day. They loved the local sound effects and the local action and the local issues. But it stopped. The donors decided they wanted to work with TV with different people. So these things happen. But also, now we are trying to work with not only with training, but with really being innovative in how you train. We are working with people in youth camps, combining nonviolence and adventure, in the hopes that this can become a pilot for a nonviolent national youth service, which will be something that will be compulsory for all 18 year olds in Palestine and that will then involve community building and so on. So this is part of our current innovation. But perhaps lesson six is more important. That nonviolence, it's not about preaching. It's about creating space. It's about allowing. It's about hearing, being heard, allowing to be heard, seeing being seen, allowing to be seen, allowing room for resonance. And one of our nonviolence trainers, someone who spent a lot of time in prison, like many Palestinians, he works particularly with people in the prisons in the north of the country. And he works, he puts months and months and months of work into working with people who would have become suicide bombers. He addresses these people, he sits with them, sits with their families, and he argues with them. He convinces them that if they want to end the occupation, the best way to do this is through nonviolence, that they can contribute more to Palestine if they're alive and working with nonviolence than if they do anything else, that this is really the answer. And he convinces many people. Now these people work as leading advocates. And some of them just took part in one of these uh, adventure camps that I mentioned. So this is, this is partly where our focus is. I think what I would like uh, to conclude with is how there's always choice. We have a choice of what prism we look through. We want to look through the prism of the victim that demonizes the other. Do we want to look through the prism of fear? Everything becomes worrying, insecure. Or do we want to look through a different prism? One where we create a future, co-create a future that does not believe in the superiority of violence. There's a myth that military superiority brings security. Where in the world do any of you know anywhere where superior military force brings more security? Where does it work? It's a myth. Military force does not bring security. Let's try to demilitarize our minds. Let's use our minds for imagination, for creating through our minds the future that we would like to see here. Let's demilitarize and co-create our future.